Before we begin this week's Parsha podcast, I have to tell you what happened just a few days ago. I bumped into my friend Ira, and he's walking in one direction, and I'm walking in the other direction, and we meet, and he's pointing to his ears, and he's saying, I'm listening to you, I'm listening to the Parsha podcast as we speak. And he said some wonderful things about the Parsha podcast. He says, it's fantastic, it's wonderful, it's splendid, but I only have one complaint. Ira, what's your complaint? He says, when you start the Parsha podcast, you just jump right into it. You don't uh, sit around for any pleasantries. You don't give any long-winded introductions. There's no music or promos or things that you could just skip. You should give yourself some introduction and tell us about yourself and who you are. And this is the, the Parsha podcast. So in heeding... Ira's advice. We aim to please here. We aim to please here at the Parsha Podcast from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. I'll give a brief introduction. My name is Yaakov, Yaakov Wolby, RabbiWolby at gmail.com. I'm in the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. It's Parsha's Vaera, and this is the Parsha Podcast. You happy, Ira? You are happy? Let's begin. So, of course, our Parsha is mostly oriented around the plagues. Jewish people, they're in Egypt, they're enslaved, they are tormented, they are oppressed, and the Almighty is going to rescue them. And last week, we read about Moshe. He selected his first foray to try to save the Jewish people. doesn't really go as planned, but our Parsha, things start happening. We have the seven, the first seven of the ten plagues. And, of course, that's going to culminate next week's Parsha, the final three plagues and the ultimate redemption and the Exodus. Today, I want to focus on a different part of the Parsha, when Moshe and Aaron are reintroduced, even though Moshe and Aaron are featured already last week. We don't know their pedigree. We don't know exactly where they come from. And in our Parsha, we're given the bad story, we're given their ancestry, and it goes through the families of, of Ruvain and then Shimon and then Levi, Levi, until it attributes Moshe and Aaron to their parents, Amram and Yocheved. And then we read about how Aaron married Elisheva and about Aaron's son, his children, but his son, Elazar, the son of Aaron, and who he married... He married, this is in chapter 6, verse 25, and Elazar, the son of Aaron, married from the daughters of Putiel, and they bore a child, and that is Pinchas, and thus concludes the heads of the families of the tribe of Levi. So we read about, again, the backstory, the families, the pedigree of Moshe and Aaron, and some of their children, and Elazar, who later on in the Torah is going to replace Aaron as the high priest, as the Kohen Gadol, he married from among the daughters of Putiel, and he bore Pinchas. Of course, Pinchas is going to play a very prominent role later on in the Torah. He is going to have a parsha named after him. In the Book of Numbers, we'll read about his heroism, his gallantry, and his zealotry. But who exactly did Elazar marry? from the daughters of Putiel. Now, who is Putiel? Who is this individual? So Rashi, of course, is going to give us the answer, and he tells us something really interesting. So again, it's a little bit off subject. The main subject of the Parsha, of course, is the Exodus, but it's introduced. We we have this introduction of the families of of Levi and Moshe and Aaron, and we read about Elazar's wife from the daughters of Putiel, and there's something very interesting and I think very helpful and beneficial for us to examine and explore and investigate. So who is this Putiel character? Rashi says something fascinating. Putiel is a reference to not one person, but two people. There are two people who are Putiel. Number one, it's a descendant of Jethro. And Jethro is Putiel number one. Why? Because Jethro, he used to be an idolater, and he would fatten calves for idolatry. 
when he would offer a sacrifice for the idols, he would first make sure that the, the calf that he's going to offer is nice and plump, nice and chunky. He would fatten it. And the Hebrew word for fattening a calf is pitame. So he was pitame the animals, and therefore he's putiel. And that's the first putiel. And the second putiel, Rashi tells us, is Joseph. Because Joseph would belittle his yetzahara. And the Hebrew word for belittling is pitpeit. And therefore, when it talks about putiel, and this is the origin of the wife of Elazar and the mother of Pinchas, who does it come from? Who are these ancestors of Pinchas? It's the two Putiels, Jethro and Joseph. Jethro would fatten the calves for idolatry, and Joseph would belittle and would scoff at the Sahara. And this is the pedigree of the wife of Elazar and the son of Elazar, Pinchas, Joseph, and Jethro. Now, the Talmud, the book of Sota, page 43a, the Talmud has been unsure exactly what the precise pedigree is. If his father's mother, so his maternal grandfather, was from Joseph, well, then his maternal grandmother is from Jethro or maybe vice versa. But Putiel is two people, and that's why it says the daughters of Putiel, because there are two people that are characterized as Putiel. That's the backstory of the subject that we want to talk about today. Pinchas a character, of course, that's going to play a great and important role later on in the Torah. He's introduced here with the expanded families of Levi. And his father is Elazar. His grandfather is Aaron. But Elazar, he married from the doors of Putiel, from Jethro, and from Joseph. So there are a few questions that we need to investigate. And this is going to open up a very interesting study and analysis. Putiel. Rashi says it's referring to two people. There are two Putiels. Jethro, he would fatten the calves for idolatry. He doesn't want no scrawny animals. You don't have any any weak and feeble. Got to have nice fat calves. And Jethro was so committed to idolatry back in the day before he converted, before he became a believer, when he was still a pagan idolater, he would fatten the calves. And that's why it's called Putiel. And Joseph, he would belittle the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. That's why he's called Putiel as well. First question we want to ponder is the characterization of Jethro as a calf fattener. We have a principle that it is prohibited to remind a penitent of their former life. Someone was a sinner, did terrible things, but there's a concept of tshuva, of repentance. And when a person repents, it is prohibited to remind this person of their previous behavior. Similarly, it is prohibited to remind a convert of their previous life. Jethro has a scandalous past. He used to be an idolater, but not just an ordinary idolater. He could fatten up those calves, make sure they're nice and plump and healthy, because he really was dedicated. He had devotion in his idolatry. But is this appropriate? Talmud tells us, the book of Bamatia, page 58b, you're not allowed to remind a penitent nor a convert of their past. The Talmud elsewhere in the book of Sanhedrin, page 94a, tells us, if you have a convert, even after many generations have elapsed, you cannot make fun of the nation that they came from. Up to 10 generations. Someone is from the Arameans, and they converted, became Jewish, and it's been six, seven generations. So they're really integrated. They're really assimilated into the nation. Still! You cannot make fun of those previous nations. How are we making fun here of, of Jethro? Jethro, we call him Putiel. Why? Because he was Pitame. He would fatten those calves when he was an idolater. The Torah is apparently violating the principle that we're not allowed to remind a penitent 
nor a convert of their previous past. And thus, it seems very inappropriate to name Jethro as a calf fattener. Now, this question I saw my grandfather of blessed memory asked in one of his works, and he does not offer an answer. It's a great mystery. It's a very difficult question that we must ponder. Moreover, Rashi tells us that there's there's two putils. There's putil one, and that's Jethro, who's the fat and the calves. And there's putil number two, and that's Joseph, who would belittle and scoff and mock sardonically his Yetzahara. And this is maybe a, a deep question. We're talking about Pinchas. Pinchas is going to be a big hero later on the Torah. And we're highlighting his his ancestry, his pedigree. And we're talking about the fact that he comes from Jethro, and we characterize Jethro as someone who would fatten the calves for idolatry. If this is how Pinchas is attributed, it must be that the influence of Jethro as a calf fattener was somehow evident, was somehow present, was somehow manifested in Pinchas. Where exactly do we find that? Where are Jethro's fingerprints, specifically as a calf fattener for idolatry, where is that found in Pinchas? And by extension, you know, both Joseph, the belittler of the Yetzirah, and Jethro as an idolater, both of them are present somehow in the pedigree of Pinchas, it seems like very conflicting ways to understand the the spiritual backstory, so to speak, of this very prominent figure. So these are some questions that we have from our Parsha. But there's more questions. And I must say, I'm, I'm very proud of this podcast that you're listening to. So you have to do, do me a favor and, and bear with me because we're trying to build add a bunch of series of questions that we will hopefully please God with the help of the Almighty will will answer with one principle that is very interesting and very pertinent. Here's a second question, a question that most likely you've never heard before. Moshe has two sons. Two sons. Son number one is Gershom. It's a little confusing because Levi had a son, Gershon, with an N. And Moshe has a son, Gershom, with an M. A little confusing. But that's son number one. Moshe has a second son named Eliezer. And this is also confusing because Aaron, Moshe's brother, has a son, Elazar. And Moshe has a son, Eliezer. Very similar names, slightly different. So Moshe has two sons. Gershom, and Eliezer. Now, as we know, many names in the Torah, they're not just given randomly. Marcus, Spencer, the the names have meaning. And many times in the Torah, not always, but many times, when the Torah tells us the name of a given person, it often also gives us the reason why they were thus named. So Ruvain, Reuben, Shimon, Levi, Judah, in the book of Genesis, the sons of Jacob, we were were told why they were thus named. So not all, but many of the characters in the Torah were given the reason for their name. Now Moshe has two sons, Gershom and Eliezer, And in both of them, we are, in fact, we're told the reason why they are thus named. So why did Moshe name his son Eliezer? The verse tells us. So a verse in Parshas Yisro, a couple of weeks, we'll read it. Exodus chapter 18, verse 4. paro. When uh, Moshe is rejoined by his family, we, we read the reason. Moshe, the Torah tells us the reason why he named his son Eliezer, for the God of my father was in my aid, and he saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. So Eliezer, we know exactly why Moshe named his son Eliezer. What about Gershom? So Gershom, we know the reason as well. 
the preceding verse, this is Exodus chapter 18, verse 3. The verse tells us that the reason why he named his son Gershom, because the word Ger means a foreigner, and I was a foreigner, Ger Hayisi Be'eretz Nachir, in a foreign land, and to indicate or to, to remember to assign for posterity Moshe's life as a foreigner in a foreign land, he named his son Gershom. So Moshe has two sons, Eliezer and Gershom. Both of them we know the reason why they have that name. But here's the unusual part. In chapter 2 of the book of Genesis, verse 22, we read about Moshe's son Gershom, the aforementioned Gershom, Moshe bore a child, or Moshe and Zipporah bore a child, and they named the child Gershom. Why? Because he said, Ger ha'isi beretz nachria. I was a foreigner in a foreign land. The only person in the entire Torah regarding whom we learn the reason for their name twice is Gershom. Again, Moshe has two sons, Eliezer. We're only told once why he has that name. Gershom, on the other hand, twice, once in Exodus chapter 2 and once in Exodus chapter 18, with identical verses, the same exact words, Tiamar, Gerhaisi, Baretz Nachuya, appears twice in the Torah, identical words, identical verses. Why was Gershom thus named? We're told it twice. With with Jacob, we're not told that. With Abraham, we're not told at all why he's named Abraham, or at least Abraham initially. There's no one else in the Torah regarding whom there's a reason for them to be given that specific name, and we're told it twice. So it seems very redundant. Of course, the Torah doesn't do that. The Torah doesn't give us extra words, extra verses. There is a unique phenomenon that appears exactly once in the whole Torah. And the question is why? Why, with respect to Gershom and no one else, are we twice told why he was thus named in identical verses? It's a new question. We've never asked this question on the Parsha podcast before. And to make Ira happy, to placate Ira, I'll remind you, Station ID, this is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby from the Torch Center in Texas. Check out some of our other shows, some of our other podcasts. You can email me, call me, text me, RabbiWolby.com. Okay, next question. This question is courtesy of my friend and study partner, David. Goes by David. David Byron, who I'm trying to persuade to do a guest episode on the Parsha podcast? Maybe, maybe we'll see. Here's his question. Last week's Parsha, Moshe has to escape from Egypt. And he goes to Midian. And he goes to the well. That's where you find a spouse, he learned from Jacob. And he gets there, and then he meets the family, the daughters of Jethro. The daughters of Jethro, they come and they are shepherding Jethro's flock. And then some unnamed shepherds come and start harassing them and start to banish them. And Moshe gets up and Moshe intervenes and Moshe defends these defenseless girls. We're told in the Midrash that it wasn't just ordinary harassment. It was of the most severe kind. And then these girls, the daughters of Jethro, they go home, and Jethro is surprised to see them. Why are you home so fast? Why was this trip so much speedier than it usually is? And they say, well, there was an Egyptian man who saved us from our oppressors. And also gave to our animals to, to drink. And they say, well, where is he now? <laughs> you didn't bring him home? Maybe he'll marry one of you. And indeed, Moshe marries Sipora, and uh, they they bear two children, and we know the rest of the story. But why was 
the daughters of Jethro being harassed. Why were they being harassed? So Rashi tells us that Jethro was a priest. The verse tells us he was a priest of Midian. But he had repudiated idolatry. He had rejected idolatry. So he was previously the priest, but then he hung up his cleats, he retired, he repudiated idolatry. And as a result, he was excommunicated. And his daughters were fair game. He was a minister for idolatry who had rejected it. And as a result, he was persona non grata. He was a pariah and his daughters were harassed. Now the Midrash gives us some more details here. It says that Jethro was a minister for idolatry. And then he realized that it's a bunch of baloney. It's not true. It's fake. So he spurned it. He rejected it. And even before Moshe came, he repented. And he became a believer in the Almighty. But he had a day job. (laughs) His day job was a minister for idolatry. So he gathered the whole city, and he kind of broke the news to his constituents. And he says, listen, I used to be the minister, and I would uh, do all the rituals. Ah, I'm old. I'm old. Go find a different minister. And he took all the paraphernalia and the accoutrements of idolatry, gave it to them, and said, I'm out. And they weren't happy. The congregation was not happy. And they ostracized him. And they excommunicated him. And they said, you are not welcome here anymore. And no one's going to help you. And no one's going to do any business with you. And no one's going to engage with you in commerce. No one's even going to shepherd your sheep. And therefore, Jethro had no choice. He had no choice. There was no one going to shepherd his sheep. And he went to every shepherd in town. Would you shepherd my sheep? No, 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 you're not welcome. So he had to hire his daughters. And even his daughters were attacked. Jethro became an outcast because he rejected idolatry. And he was vilified by his countrymen. And they would attack his daughters. And evidently this was a daily occurrence because, again, the verse tells us that Jethro was surprised. Why did he come back so fast? He was surprised at the rapid return of his daughters and he inquired about it. So he clearly expected his daughters to be harassed. Yet he sent them nonetheless. So this is the question that my study partner asked. Why did Jethro send his daughters like sheep to the slaughter, vulnerable to go lead the animals? Every day they were being harassed, every single day. One day Moshe saved them, and that was the, that was the outlier. That was the unique occurrence. What parent does that to their daughter? Maybe he should have done it himself. If they were being repeatedly harassed every day, it seems very wrong of him to send them out. Why did Jethro send his daughters? Another idea, another subject that we need to introduce, and that is the unusual arrangement, the unusual agreement between Moshe and Jethro. The Midrash tells us something utterly fascinating. Moshe married Jethro's daughter, Zipporah. And in the old ways of chivalry, Moshe asked Jethro for Zipporah's hand in marriage. And Jethro says, yes, on one condition. You have to accept one condition before I allow you to marry my daughter. What is it? Jethro responded with a very strange and unusual request. 
The first son that is born to you and my daughter, says Jethro, he should be dedicated to idolatry. All subsequent children, you could raise them however you want, and I would imagine you would want to raise them with dedication and devotion and commitment to God. But the first one, I want to guide to the ways of idolatry. Very strange request to make of Moshe. To make things even stranger, Moshe agreed. And he said, swear to me. And Moshe swore. Did you know this? Moshe and Jethro agreed that his first son, i.e. Gershom, would be dedicated to idolatry. This was the condition that Jethro stipulated on this marriage. The rest of the kids, do whatever you want. First one is mine. They said the the cardinal rule of being a a parent-in-law is you cannot tell your children how to raise their children. And I've heard it's sometimes hard for the parents-in-law to hold back. And Jethro wanted to avoid that. He wanted the agreement in writing ahead of time, swear to it. And Moshe agreed. The commentaries actually note that the reason why Gershom is thus named, I was a foreigner in a foreign land, it's hinting to this arrangement. I had no choice. I was a foreigner in a foreign land. And that mandated that I had to give in, so to speak, to allow Gershom to serve foreign gods as per the stewardship of his grandfather Jethro. This is a very puzzling idea, a very puzzling, very strange arrangement. But of course, we don't understand. Why would Moshe agree? It's kind of puzzling. Moshe signs off on it. Moshe swears that he's going to abide by these terms. But furthermore, what's Jethro's motivation? By the time Moshe arrives, Jethro had already repudiated idolatry. Rashi says the reason why they attacked his daughters before Moshe came was because he repudiated idolatry. That's why he was an outcast. That's why he was ostracized. That's why his daughters were harassed. Yet before he agrees to allow Moshe to marry his daughter, he insists on this arrangement. The first son I want to be raised, to be reared, to follow idolatry. Why would he want to raise his grandson in the ways of idolatry? When he himself had already seen the futility of paganism and rejected it? How do we understand Jethro's motivation to dedicate Gershom to idolatry? So we have a battery of questions. Let's try to suggest an approach. Perhaps we can suggest that Jethro had a very well thought out philosophy for how to guide and direct children and how to raise them to be very strong and resolute in their beliefs. Previously, Jethro himself was a Kanyashenti of idolatry. There was no pagan deity that Jethro did not experiment with. But he arrived at the truth. He became a believer. And Jethro believed that his unique path, how he had to go through first all the other ways of living and of believing before he arrived at Torah and at God, that actually redounded to his benefit. And it made him a stronger, more God-fearing believer than he would have ever been had he not been so immersed in all the falsehoods of paganism. He looked back at his journey, and he concluded that this is the optimal way to go. This is the optimal journey. 
And this is the best way to raise a child. Deliberately bring them down the false and dangerous paths. Deliberately expose them to very fierce challenges. Deliberately manufacture adversity for them in their way. That experience will strengthen them, Jethro believed. And ultimately, when they do come to the realization that all that falsehood is a bunch of malarkey, because they have that past, their conviction, their newfound conviction, will be completely bulletproof. You have someone who's, you know, sheltered, indoctrinated, living in a very insular fashion, and told the truth from day one. Jethro believed that's not an ideal. Such a person won't be very strong in their convictions. They may even harbor like a secret fascination with all the forbidden fruit that was denied to them. Instead, Jethro advocated, give, give it to them. Let them taste it. Let them pursue it. Let them have it. Let them do it and get it out of their system. Let them see the futility of idolatry. And they're never going to crave it. Well, I've been there, done that before. Nothing to see. That was Jethro's motivation. That was his philosophy. The truth is, there's a lot of justification for this idea. The Jethroian method is, in fact, we could argue based on a very strong principle. We, we don't want to coddle our children. We want to expose them a little bit. Let them get themselves a little dirty. Let them get a few scratches. We want to give them some battle scars. We want to, we want to toughen them up, thicken their skin. We want to expose them to the rigors of life. And Jethro took this to its logical end. Show them the most dark parts of humanity. Expose them to the least appealing and glamorous things the world has to offer. And eventually, eventually, they'll grow stronger than ever. You see, parents, is different philosophies that parents have. How much do you allow your children, just in a physical sense, to be exposed to germs and viruses? Some parents have the philosophy, oh, it's okay, let them eat dirt, chew a little soil. It, it builds their constitution. And they have other parents who keep them very, keep their children in a very sterile environment. Everything's got to be perfectly squeaky clean. But then they're, they're weak. And they're vulnerable. They're always catching cold and always under the weather, not feeling great. Become susceptible to every vibe. Everything that grows around, you catch. The other approach is you get, uh, get them tough. Make them impervious to illness. Give them a rock-solid constitution. Yes, you could share germs. Yes, you could slurp up that soda that spilled on the floor. It's okay to have a play date when the other kid has the sniffles. These are different philosophies. And obviously these are, these are caricatures. This is the extremes. But there is a principle that I think is very logical. And it makes a lot of sense. And it may even work out in the real world. When someone lives a little bit of a rougher childhood, they could become stronger as a result. You know, my, my favorite comic strips, Calvin and Hobbes, it's the best one. What can we say? But one of the recurring themes was that his dad always tells him about all the things he doesn't want to do, is that it, it builds character. And I, I googled it when I was thinking about this idea Apparently, there's like a there's like a wiki for Calvin and Hobbes, and there's a whole long list of all the themes across all the various comic strips that Calvin is told they build character. All the things he doesn't want to do, his father tells him, it builds character. A whole long list. And even though Cal Calvin doesn't like it, this is a good argument. And this was Jethro's method of raising strong children. His daughters were being harassed on a daily basis. And he knew it. 
And he expected it. And he sent them out nonetheless. It builds character. Toughen them up. If you live a pampered and coddled childhood, what's going to be good to the real world? Says Jethro. Go. Deal with it. Have to contend with all this madness. You will emerge stronger. This was Jethro's philosophy. He wanted to create manufactured adversity and thereby raise stronger and more resilient children. And that was not limited to just physical challenges. On a spiritual level, Jethro wanted to do the same. By the time Moshe arrived, Jethro had already experimented with all the idolatries and already repudiated them all. He knew that they were just baseless. But he believed that his journey and and all of his exposure actually made him a stronger and more resilient believer in God. Had he not had those experimentations, he would not have been as strong in his faith. And he thought that this is the ideal way to raise a child. Give them a taste of the craziness. Let them explore all the madness, all the insanity that happens in those pagan societies. Go wild. Experiment with all the debaucherous moral turpitude of the pagan deities. Eventually, Jethro was confident they would come to realize It's wrong, it's corrupt, it's immoral, it's depraved, it's vile. And then they're going to come back to motion his ways in a stronger and more certain fashion. Jethro, you imagine, would be a fan of the Rumspringer. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Let them go crazy, go wild, drive cars and watch television, use mechanized tools and binge on electricity. See how much you actually like it. You'll come back around. Yeah, electricity, it's overrated. But in all seriousness, there is a philosophy here. By exploring and considering and embracing the other side that you know is bad and harmful, that will boomerang and result in a much stronger and more resolute faith eventually. And that was Jethro's philosophy. And he only agreed to have Moshe marry Sipora if Moshe signed off on those terms. The first son, he's going to be the guinea pig for Jethro's philosophy. And Moshe agreed. And Gershon was raised by Jethro. In last week's parish, we read about the circumcision in the hotel on the way to Egypt. Now, Rashi tells us that this was Moshe's second son, Eliezer. He wasn't circumcised and they had to rush down to Egypt. And then he gets to the hotel and he should have circumcised the baby right away. And he waited. And that's why the angel masquerading as a snake attacked Moshe. That's Rashi, chapter 4, verse 24. The Targum Yonasan, he says that that wasn't Eliezer. That was Gershom. And he tells us something fascinating. Gershom was uncircumcised. And the reason why Gershom was uncircumcised was because of this agreement. Jethro says, Gershom is mine. I'm going to raise him like an idolater, like... A pagan. I'm not allowing you to give him a circumcision. And thus, Gershom was uncircumcised. That was part of the terms of the agreement between Jethro and Moshe. He's got to be a total idolater. But then when Jethro agreed to allow Moshe to go to Egypt, he absolved him from the terms of this pact. And now Moshe was attacked for delaying the circumcision of Gershom. But up until that point, Gershom was exposed to all the idols. He had this managed immersion in idolatry overseen by his 
maternal grandfather, Jethro. Now, how did this all work out? What are the results of this experiment? The answer? It was kind of mixed. There's at least one black eye on this family's legacy. Gershom had a son named Jonathan. Now, Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moshe, does not appear in the Torah, but he does appear in the book of Judges. So this is Moshe's grandson. Moshe has a son, Gershom. Gershom has a son, Jonathan. And in the book of Judges, chapters 17 and 18, we read about this individual who was a priest for the idolatrous image of Micha, Moshe's own grandson, the son of Gershom, Gershom the guinea pig, became a priest for idolatry. How does such a thing happen? How does Moshe suffer such a fate? How can it be that Moshe's own grandson became a priest for idolatry? How did Gershom have this happen to him? How did idolatry ever find its way into the most prestigious of families? The answer, the commentaries tell us, it's all because of this Jethro experiment. The Balaturim, for example, in chapter 2 of Exodus, tells us that the word Vilikohen and to the Kohen, to the priest, that word appears precisely three times in all of Scripture. Once by Moshe marrying Zipporah, and twice in the episode of the image of Micah, of Micha in the book of Judges. And the reason why this word, this word's connecting these two, says the Balaturim, because when Moshe married the daughter of Jethro, he had to promise that the first son that will be born to him will be a priest for idolatry. And for that, Moshe was punished that his grandson became a priest for idolatry. And that's Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moshe. Even though his identity is a little bit concealed, the scripture presents it as Menashe, not Moshe. But our sages tell us that this is the, the grandson of Moshe. Now, it's also pretty obvious if you compare the verses, you have two almost identical verses, Exodus 2.21 and Judges 17.11. Moshe agreed to live with the man, and this Levi, i.e. the grandson of Moshe, agreed to live with the man, namely with the idolaters. So it's almost telling us explicitly that because Moshe agreed to the terms of this arrangement with Jethro, his grandson agreed to the terms of Micha and became an idolater. The Talmud of the book of Bava Basra, page 109b, going into 110a, talks about the story at length. How did this happen? How could Moshe's own grandson participate in an idolatrous temple? And the Talmud does the math for us. It attributes it not to Moshe, but to Moshe's father-in-law, to Jethro. And because he had this idolatrous penchant and past, that rippled through the generations and it was manifested in his great-grandson, the grandson of Moshe, Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moshe. So we see that Jethro's philosophy of manufactured adversity, at least in the case of Gershom and his son Jonathan, it was a colossal failure. Now there is a happy postscript to this story. The Talmud tells us that when Moshe's grandson was confronted, you're the grandson of Moshe. What are you doing over here in this idolatrous temple? So he responded, that he's so destitute. And he has a tradition, going back to his grandfather Moshe, that a person should always be willing to do avodah zarah or avodah zarah 
and not request help from society. Don't request for charity. Even be willing to do avodazara. Now, the word avodazara, it means avodazara, which means idolatry. But literally, the word avoda means work, and zara means foreign work. Moshe had a maxim. Be willing to do anything. Peel potatoes, scrub counters, do menial labor. That's good. You have a job, you're making an honest living, even though, you know, you maybe have a PhD and you really should be doing bigger things and you're underemployed. Moshe says, it's okay. It's okay. Be willing to do something like that and don't ask for handouts from society. His grandson had misunderstood his maxim, the Talmud tells us. He had conflated, he had swapped the concept of foreign work, namely to work for something that's not really befitting you. He had conflated that with idolatry. And once they corrected it, he left the house of idolatry. He was actually hired, the Talmud tells us, by by David. David hired him for a prestigious position, and he completely repented. That is a nice epilogue to this story. But this is just an amazing and terrifying idea. Jethro had a philosophy, a theory, for how to raise children. And Moshe agreed to allow him to experiment with Gershom. And at least in the case of Jonathan, Ben Gershom, Ben Moshe, it backfired spectacularly. But maybe we can add, it wasn't a total failure. I want to suggest that maybe there were others who had a different result with this Jethroian method. In our parish, we read about Pinchas. Pinchas and his pedigree. Well, who did he come from? The daughters of Putiel. Well, who's Putiel? Well, it's Jethro, who fattened cows, baby cows, calves, for idolatry, and Joseph, who belittled and mocked his Yetzahara. And we asked a few questions, you know, how could be the Torah enshrines for posterity, the former ways of, of Jethro? A. B, if the Torah attributes Pinchas back to Jethro specifically as a calf fattener for idolatry, then it must be that the influence of Jethro in that role, in that capacity, is manifested in Pinchas. Pinchas must display the fingerprints, the influence of Jethro in his former career as a calf fattener for idolatry. And he has that, he manifests that, and Joseph's intrepid resistance to the Yetzara, belittling it, mocking it, scoffing at it, and ridiculing it. Maybe this is what's happening over here. Perhaps we can say that Pinchas is the other side of the coin of Jonathan. Pinchas was also raised with the influence of his antecedent Jethro, the calf fattener. And this is not criticism of Jethro. This is the approach that he had. This is the method that he had. He believed in this method. So maybe when the Torah is telling us that Pinchas came from a calf fattener, it means that he too was subjected to some degree or another to the same treatment that Gershom was treated. He wasn't sheltered. He wasn't insulated. To some extent, he had some exposure to the harmful ways, to the harmful influences in the manner of Jethro the calf fattener. But maybe, unlike Jonathan, for Pinchas had a very different result. Pinchas is considered to be the most fiery zealot for God. A zealot is someone that has such unflinching faith, such commitment to God, such an unwillingness to tolerate any besmirching of God's honor. That they just, they just act impulsively in their love of God. And the Talmud tells us, and this is a subject, of course, we'll talk more about Parshas Balak and Parshas Pinchas. There were certain things that Pinchas did that were even greater than Moshe. 
where did Pinchas get this resolve, this strength of character, this unbending will to stand up for God, to risk his life, to risk ridicule and derision, standing up for the honor of Hashem. Pinchas is this immovable, solid, great exemplar of faith in God. Where does that come from? Perhaps Pinchas is a Jethroian method success story. For him, this unusual approach yielded wonderful results. And maybe we know the reason why as well. Why did this approach work so well for Pinchas? He came from the daughters of Putiel. Not just one daughter, the other daughter. He came from Jethro, but he also came from the other Putiel influence. He also came from Joseph. Joseph is the preeminent example, the the poster child of someone who went through very difficult adversity, went through hell, alienation from his family, physical and spiritual danger of the most severe kind, thrust into the most adverse of situations, both physically and spiritually. And he emerged from that not only intact, but stronger than he would have been otherwise. Joseph is someone that, like Jethro, went through that crazy batch story and emerged much stronger. Pinchas is the byproduct of both Putiel influences. Thanks to the, the, the resolve and the ferocious strength of character of Joseph coursing within him, the other Putiel influence of, of Jethro fattening the cows did no harm. Maybe, to the contrary, maybe it further steeled his resolve and his fortitude. We mentioned that twice the Torah explains to us the origin of Gershom's name. The only person whose reasoning for his name is featured twice in the Torah, in identical verses, Tiamar, Geraisi, Be'eretz Nachria. Perhaps now we know the answer. Gershom was named after the experiment of Jethro. What are the results of such an experiment? This is a double-edged sword. There are very different, very divergent outcomes that can happen from such an approach. To be a foreigner in a foreign land can have, can have two very different results. On one hand, it could look like Jonathan, Ben Gershom, Ben Moshe, or it could even result as Pinchas from the family of Putiel. You could be a foreigner in a foreign land, exposed to the elements, surrounded by all that adversity, and you could capitulate, you could succumb, you could be sucked into the maelstrom of idolatry. You could also be a foreigner in a foreign land and maintain your identity and steal it against erosion and get immeasurably stronger from being the foreigner in the foreign land. Jethro had a unique approach with his daughters, with his grandchildren. He wanted to deliberately create for them insecurity, instability, manufactured artificial adversity. Throw them into the shark-infested waters. If you you don't die, you'll become a very good swimmer. If you can endure, you'll get very toughened, very strengthened from it. Some battle scars can really... Strengthen a person. That was Jethro's approach. And is it the right thing or the wrong thing? It's hard for us to judge, but maybe we can speculate that Jethro himself changed his tune. In chapter 18 of Exodus, Jethro reappears, and Moshe is standing from morning to night judging the people. 
And what does he tell Moshe? It's a bad system. Pace yourself. You won't manage. You'll fall apart. Jethro is trying to make it easier for Moshe, not harder. What, hap- what happened to Jethro who wants to always manufacture adversity? What about this idea of toughen them up, strengthen them, allow them to be vulnerable? Maybe he changed. Moreover, Jethro then leaves. This is the final verse of chapter 18, verse 27. Jethro leaves and he goes to his land, Rashi tells us, to convert the rest of his family. Jethro leaves the nation to go court, to go persuade, to go woo his family to convert to Judaism. What about uh, sending them the way of idolatry? Allowing them to come to it on his, on their own? Maybe Jethro changed his approach. So maybe the conclusion is that Jethro's approach was not proper, certainly not in the most important of matters. Of course, no one lives in a completely adversity-free world. We all have challenges and we all sometimes have to swim with the sharks. But if God throws you a curveball, that's one thing. You don't deliberately ask for those curveballs. The, the Talmud tells us, the book of Sanhedrin, page 107a, a person should never try to beckon a test, never ask for a test, never bring a moral or spiritual test upon themselves. Why? Because David, the king of Israel, David Melech Israel, he wanted a test and he blundered, he stumbled. He had approached God and said, well, we said God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. What about God of David? That has a nice ring to it. Why are only the patriarchs, why are they the only ones who have the name of God applied to them? And God responded, well, they were tested. And you weren't tested. And therefore they have the name of God upon them, and you don't. So David says, okay, challenge accepted. Test me. Quotes the verse in Psalms 26, verse 2. B'chaneni Hashem. Test me, God. Naseni, test me. And it didn't work out. He was tested. And he floundered. Now, coincidentally, Of course, if you're a believer, you know there's no such a thing as a coincidence. Yesterday, I was in South Florida. I was there for a day and a half or so. My parents were staying there. I like to go visit them for a few days every winter. So usually I go to New York to visit them in New York. But they had spent a week and change in South Florida, in Boynton Beach, Boynton funny word. I thought it was really funny. Boynton Beach. So they said, you know, don't come to visit us in New York. Come to Florida. So I was I was there Sunday night to Tuesday night. And I bumped into my friend, Ellie Tillis, when I was there. And he gave me his wonderful manuscript called Ladder to Shemaim, Ladder to Heaven on the five final Psalms. And I was perusing it And I saw a fascinating piece on this idea. David wanted to be tested. B'chaneni Hashem, test me Hashem. Naseni, test me Hashem. So in his book that he gave me, that I I brought home, even though I had flown on spirit and I didn't uh, take, I didn't take an extra bag because I don't want to pay for that extra bag. So my backpack was all full. And then I slipped his book into my backpack. And I said, well, I can't go to South Florida and not buy something for my family. So I bought a gift for everyone in the family and somehow it all fit into the backpack. It was like a uh, the room of requirement, this little, small, little backpack that I'd taken with me. But anyhow, he says something very interesting. He cites an opinion. We you know the uh, the famous psalm of Ashrei. 
It has every sentence, every verse starts with the successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet, of the Aleph base. So it starts with Ashrei and goes on from there. But there's one letter, the letter Nun, that there's no verse that starts with that letter. Why? So he cites an opinion that David made the same mistake of following Jethro's advice, of asking for trouble, of seeking manufactured, artificial, man-imposed adversity. And it didn't work out well for him. And this idea of a nisayon, of a test, starts the letter nun. So David omitted the letter nun to caution us, to caution us against trying to seek a test. We don't follow Jethro in this matter. Maybe he himself, towards the end of his life, he himself changed his attitude. But certainly not in matters of heresy. We don't tempt ourselves in those matters. Talmud tells us the book of Avodah Zarah, page 17a, Shani minus demashri, heresy is seductive. It draws a person. Don't think that you'll be cleverer than the heretics. I'm going to study all the heresy and I'm going to know what they know and I'll be able to outfox them in our debates. And my exposure to heresy will ultimately be better for me. Maybe. But it's not worth the risk. The proper approach, David tells us, he omits the letter none. The proper approach is to avoid heresy. In general, it's safer to avoid tests and challenges. In many places in the Talmud, we read the following axiom. Schar, schar, we tell the Nazir. The Nazir is not, not allowed to have wine. We tell him, schar, schar, go around. Le karma lo sikrav, to the orchard, to the vineyard, do not get close. If you're Another, you're not allowed to have wine and grape derivatives. Take the circuitous route. Avoid a test. I think in general, this is a very interesting subject to ponder. I think that if we are going to be successful in raising our children, we have to figure out what exactly we want to expose them to and in what do we want to shield them, what areas... Do we want to shelter them? What areas of life do we want to expose them to? And and maybe there is some truth to what Jethro proposed. Expose them to some things that we don't want them to ultimately cling to, but we hope that uh, they'll reject it eventually. And what are the things that we're not going to expose our children to? What are the red lines we're not going to cross? What are the hills we're going to die on? You know, and no parent would ever in their right mind say, you know what, there are so many problems with uh, drug abuse and heroin and fentanyl and meth. It's so bad for you. But let me give it to my kids and they'll wise up and they'll reject it. Of course, no one would do that. But what about a, a chocolate bar? It's unhealthy. It's full of sugar full of seed oils. It could cause diabetes and obesity and all kinds of problems. But of course, that's much more innocuous than uh, hard drugs. So where exactly do you put the line and say, oh, this is okay. We don't want someone to become obsessed with eating chocolate bars, but eh, that's okay. You'll grow out of it. It'll be fine. When I was in Florida, I was spending some time, the whole time really, with my parents. So my parents have a guest staying by their house, a family from Israel that is in the United States for some sort of medical procedure, some sort of medical treatment. And they're staying with my parents for, for a month. But my father's describing that they're, they're there with their eight or nine-year-old son, And he has his little smartphone, and he says he's glued to his phone 
24-6. And then it's Shabbos, so he can't use his phone. But the whole day he's pacing like an addict, pacing, waiting for the time to finish. And it's like, ah, how much time do I have left? How much time do I have left? How much time do I have left? And he's just, Shabbos is over, right away, grabs his phone and just is completely transfixed on the phone. Enchanted with the little dopamine hits of the phone. It's, it's really unhealthy. It's destructive. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Is unrestricted access to phones for kids, unrestricted access to the internet for kids, is that a good thing? Is that one of those uh, red lines or not? The parent has made that decision. You know, we don't have a television in our house. But I want my kids to follow sports and to watch sports. Not because I think it's an, an inherently good thing. In fact, I don't think it's a good thing. To be perfectly honest, it's a waste of time. And time is the most precious commodity that we have. We're here. The Almighty gives us time to do mitzvahs, to advance the cause of our soul. And you're going to waste it watching people who don't know of you, don't care about you, and they just happen to be wearing a, a, the, the, this laundry versus that laundry and they're playing a child sport, and that makes sense to watch it for hours and hours on end? I don't think it's a good thing. But in this area, we, we chose to be more allowing. As you know, I've said this in the past, not giving our kids a smartphone, that is the hill that we die on. I tell my kids, I'll buy you a car, I'll let you have a gun, I'll let you ride a motorcycle, whatever. This is the red line for me. Now, I'm not saying that this has to be the red line for everyone. I'm not proposing that. But I think this subject is a fascinating one to ponder and to ruminate upon and to consider. Jethro thought that it's proper to allow the kids to do idolatry. That's a good thing to do. We know that's a, that's a red line. Maybe this is a surprising thought, but I remember in seventh grade when we learned biology or earth science, remember them talking about how, hey, there, there's some heresy here. There's some heresy here. You're going to teach the kids about evolution or the world, uh, just the Big Bang, and wh- where's the mention of God? If you say, listen, we, the, the Almighty may have used evolution or a big bang to bring about the world, I don't think that that conflicts with what we believe. But is this something that we're playing with fire? We're allowing our, our children to, to be exposed to those things which are heretical. Are we confident that they're going to grow out of it? If you give a child a phone without any filter that removes any harmful content, This is dangerous. You know they're not going to get addicted. They're not going to lose their capacity to think complex thoughts. They're not going to lose their capacity to have delayed gratification. Some of the sharpest people in the world are spending their whole time thinking about how do we get kids or adults, anyone, to to, to be more addicted Again, we're not arguing that you should opt for total isolation and total seclusion. I think that it's appropriate to have some targeted doses of Jethro's manufactured adversity. You know, Calvin's dad has a point. Let the kids taste some things that are objectively harmful, and you hope they won't crave it later on. If a child is denied sweets completely, it's possible that when they get older, they'll just go crazy. You don't want that either. But this is a very important thing that we have to think about. And if we're going to be successful in our parenting, we have to really consider how exactly we're going to present the world to our children, what are we going to expose them to? What are we going to withhold from them? It's a very interesting subject, a fascinating one, and one that comes courtesy of the Parsha podcast from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. Now, as you know, we like to end off 
every Parsha podcast with a question. We think it, it raises our intelligence. And this is not a question on the Parsha per se. It's something that I was thinking about in the plane. I made the unfortunate decision, as I mentioned, to fly with spirit. It was cheaper. I have determined that their reputation is richly deserved. I was sandwiched between two people. They don't even have a tray table. And I was trying to type, I actually prepared this podcast on the way back. And I was working on some other stuff, a bunch of other projects that I have. I did got a lot of work done on Spirit, but the way there, it was really hard. And I was trying to type on my laptop, but my elbows had crossed over the, the, you know, the demarcation line. I had lost the battle, at least on one side, for the armrest. So while this is all happening, I was mulling over the following question. It's a provocative question, and I'm not directing it at you, but it's a question that I was thinking about, and I thought I would just share it with you. And that is, what are we doing in the diaspora? We are really supposed to be in Israel. You know, our family, personally, we, we lived there for five years. And we moved because we had no way to support ourselves there. And over the course of the, uh, I guess, uh, almost 11 years since we moved to Houston to join the staff here at Torch, an increasingly larger share of my work is now online. I tell my wife, I said, we could work anywhere that has a, a decent podcast studio, a good microphone, a good internet connection, and a lot of Torah books. I could work there. So this question was kind of gnawing at me the whole flight. What am I doing here? I think this question might be the product of a subject that I'm working on on my Torah 101 podcast series. For those of you who are listeners, you know that we're working on 13 Principles of Faith, and we're up to principle number 12, and that's the principle of Messiah and Redemption. And a major part of the Messianic era is the return to the land. And today, more than ever, it's it's feasible, it's doable. It's a vibrant country, it's a great economy, it's a democracy, it's a Jewish state. A lot of people speak English, it has all the amenities. Just last week, they opened up, I was told, the first 7-Eleven. You can get your Slurpees. What are we doing here? Generations of our ancestors yearned and pined just for the possibility to even see the land once. And you could get on a plane and be there in a jiffy. This is a thought that I had. It's a personal thought. I actually spoke to my parents about this when I got there. They thought it was inadvisable to relocate small children to a different country and a different culture could have a very severe culture shock. And maybe we hope to move there uh, at some point. But those is an interesting, uh, provocative question to ponder. I appreciate your listenership. I appreciate your support. I hope you enjoyed this Parsha podcast. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. A splendid and wonderful and productive rest of your week. And a quiescent uplifting, invigorating, serene and tranquil Shabbos upcoming and please God with help of the Almighty. We will get together again in the Parsha podcast. My name is Yaakov Volby. The email address is This is the Torch Center. Please God, we'll get together next week.